Hello, hello. Welcome everybody to week three. Just wanna wait a second, make sure that uh, the stream is playing properly because this is the first time we're trying YouTube, um, YouTube exclusively. So just give me one moment. There we go. Looks like we're good. Yes, there's audio. Um, excellent. So yeah, welcome to week three. Uh, we're halfway through the class and um, that's a big deal. I mean, feels like a big deal to me. So um, two weeks down, two weeks left. And uh, uh, so what I like to do first, well, first let's make sure that, um, so yeah, we definitely have some some fan or a fan at least of the YouTube player. That's good. But um, j just in case, I don't know. So I accidentally initially embedded the wrong video to the test that I did earlier and I and so it fired the notification. I wonder if people started watching that. And then when I replace the embed, they're still watching that rather than refreshing. So um, we've, we've got two people, 28 people watching right now, which is about half of what it has been um, up till this point. So um, in case, uh, yeah. So part of the part of the thing I wanted to try this week was a new layout um, kill zone that you, you bring up. And uh, it's the fact that, um, I felt that we needed some more context in the in the recorded versions of these because I would just haphazardly reference either a comment or answer a question, sometimes read them, sometimes not. And um, I'm going to try and do better about that, but I thought to be safe to go ahead and also record the chat so that anyone who watches this back later has, you know, the full context into what I'm answering. So we'll see how it goes. Also, as a bonus, uh, my face is not going to be covering up any of the presentation or Blender UI, so... That's a nice little bonus. Um, yeah, LJ Simpson, you just you, you referenced that. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about week three by first um, looking back at week two. So we had 30 homework submissions this week, um, but the assignment was to do either one, between one and three uh, individual models. And so that means we have about 66 models made last week by you guys, which is awesome. Um, the community thread was lit again. Over 500 replies to the commun class community thread. Um, that's 25 pages, uh, five times as active as any other thread. And that's exciting for me and for the rest of the crew um, who I'm sharing this information with because we want the community to be a really neat place for people to learn, to go and, and have a resource to learn, to be resources to others, to be this thriving community for people to learn Blender together, Blender or Unity um, or what, whatever we have taught in the past or will teach in the future. Um, and it's been fairly active over the years. It, um, we've certainly had some good conversations and seen people learn, but never to this degree. So I'm really, really pumped to see that kind of interaction going on because it really means com uh, quality communal learning is taking place. That was a big goal for me with these classes. I think it's definitely happening. I've seen um, critiques, that very respectful, helpful critiques. I've seen just nice comments um, affirming the work that's being done by each other. And that's incredible. That is, that's brand new to the way that, that I have taught online for the past um, four years. So um, it's pretty cool to see that and, and experience it myself. The class is awesome, plain and simple. Um, that seems to be a recurring theme for me uh, to want to share with you guys. Um, also, back in week two, I wanted to share my, my personal favorite submission which was actually really hard to come to because there were so many good submissions. And so it was hard to determine which one was my favorite and what constituted my favorite. And um, so beyond quality of, of, uh, of modeling and, and cool models to choose from, which everyone you know had that, um, I, I stuck on Grant's because his was the one that I remembered the most. Uh, as I was going through the pages, his was the one that I like I had memory of because it, it fooled me. You know, I, I looked at it the first time and it's like, oh, cool, a stack of coffee cups. That's clever. Oh, wait a minute. This is an abstract coffee cup. You know, if you look down here, the um, the bottom cup is actually connected to the middle cup by the handle. And then the upper cup is connected to the bottom by the other handle. So it's kind of like an abstract coffee cup. And someone mentioned in the chat that it's like an Escher coffee cup, which I thought was pretty cool because he did he does some abstract paintings. He's pretty famous for that kind of thing. So anyway, good job, Grant. I mean, if I, not that I'm the standard of modeling um, uh, perfection or anything like that, but uh, 
I would model this the exact same way. Um, this looks like a very uh, professionally made model. It's minimal, topology is even, and uh, yeah, so really great job. Um, also, since, since it was hard for me to decide, I wanted to do an honorable mention, mention to um, Jere Hapasharju. I hope I pronounced that right, because I really liked your models. I liked the intention behind it, that these were all related. I, I consider them related to each other as like household items, kitchen silverware. Um, that looks like a kind of like a, a spice maker, you know, grinding spices. I think that's what that's for. And then a chair, which I thought was cool that, that they all shared that theme. They're all well made. And um, what I thought was cool about this is is I wanted to encourage you to keep these because these are models that you could absolutely use over again. If you get into interior, we've been talking a little bit in the chat about interior lighting. If you wanted to stick with that, like keep these models and source it as a library. Maybe you're already planning on that, but but for a long time, I didn't do that when I was doing computer graphics. I would build everything new from the start with each new project, but um, I've since learned to collect models that can be used over again. Um, and these are, this is a good example of that. And in addition to that, if you build out a collection like this at this quality, you could easily sell it as a product on the, on the blender market if you wanted to. So um, I just wanted to highlight this. It was a, it was a cool uh, collection of, of quality models. So that was a, kind of a second place for me. And then finally, I want to shout out to the coffee cup and tire submissions. There were several of those and these, these four are not the only ones. They're just the ones I grabbed. And, and paste it into the presentation. But um, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of when I teach to, to I wanna see you um, apply what you've learned in your own unique way. And, and, and um, so I, that's still my challenge and it stands, but I don't wanna lose sight of the people who maybe aren't learning quite to that point yet. And it helps them the most to just do exactly what's asked of them. And so I wanted to highlight you guys for doing exactly what I asked. You modeled a coffee cup, you modeled a um, tire. And, um, and even, even within that, you did do slightly different um, models of, of tires and cups. So I just wanted to highlight you guys. Um, I don't, when I always challenge people to, to apply what they learn in different ways, I don't want to forget about the people who aren't quite learning to that degree yet. So um, this was awesome. I, I enjoyed seeing all those tires, quality tires, frankly, better than mine. Let's be honest. So uh, really good work there, everybody. Cool, it was an awesome week. And then the last thing, oh yeah, I need to tie up a loose end with this Joy-Con model. So I'm gonna jump into Blender real quick. And uh, this was from Thor uh, and it was a good model. It was, it, this is a good model. Um, I just wanted, I found myself repeating a lot this feedback of like even topology and um, uniformity, words like this. that ended up being a little bit difficult to explain in uh, text form. And so like with this one in particular, this was kind of the last straw where I was like, okay, I need to actually show what I'm talking about um, because it is, it is subtle. And like I mentioned in that, in that feedback, there are few rules of modeling. There are just best practices, frankly. And, um, and so there's room for subjectivity within the best practice stuff. But I wanted to show you how what best practices to me in the context of how I was grading and this model specifically. So if you, if to put myself in this context and to take you there with me, I, I look at models the way that I feel I was looked at when I was modeling professionally for, um, for the studio called Real Effects. And if I were to turn this model in, um, even though when it's smooth, it totally works. This absolutely reads very well. Um, there's visually, nothing wrong with this, frankly, but when you look at the wireframe, if I were to turn this in, my modeling supervisor would have sent it back to me and just asked for like a cleaning pass. And um, what I wanted, and I wanted to show you what that meant to me. And so one of the places up here um, is uh, the corners, the, the holding edges on these corners can be reduced and cleaned a little bit. And what that will involve is taking these three verts and merging them at the, at the middle one so we'll merge there, we'll delete these two edges, and then fill, okay? So when I smooth it now, I'll go back to object mode and see the smooth version, no difference whatsoever, but we do have, I think, two less polygons, and it's it's just a cleaner wireframe. Um, so I would recommend doing, I would do that kind of thing if I were cleaning this model, and, um, and I'll just do that real quick. In addition, you don't have to, there's a couple ways to approach it. Always more than one way to skin a cat. I can, instead of deleting the edge, I can uh, dissolve the edges and then do a uh, 
J to join a new edge in between there, in between those selected verts, and um, you know whatever order you want to do that in. So that's that's a small example of how I would want to clean things up. It's a little bit OCD-ish when I when I talk about cleaning models. Like for example, um, I would want to since this is just you know pushed up more than these edges it just kicks against that OCD and I want to bring it back down, just make it a little more even. And, uh, and then likewise, kind of even that out on the back backside. Um, less drastic edge movements and, and more subtle. Hope this is, is helping to make sense. But the last one that I wanted to show you on this particular model, and we've got a little vert hanging out there, we'll, we'll delete that, is with the, um, the hole that you drilled, so to speak, into the surface for this joystick. So I'm going to Control L and then Shift H to hide everything else in the model. And so again, even though this does work, as you can see in the smooth version, it works, okay, that's fine. But it's not the cleanest that it could be. And we have four verts here that become 12 around the edge right in here. We got 12 verts. So taking four verts and making them into 12 is a pretty drastic change. So I'm gonna delete those, and I'm gonna look for a border that is also 12 verts. So if I select what's left, we've got 10 verts. But if I delete these two verts right here, whoops, these two, um, now we've got 12. So this can very cleanly match up with the 12 in here. Um, though I'm going, I'm going to uh, extrude, I think one time, and then scale it out to maintain a perfect uh, circle in this area. Um, and then we're going to uh, fill, Let's see if it'll fill and then go all the way around. Since we have 12, we know that it'll end up looking nice. And, um, and this brings up a point that since this face of the, of the object is very flat, um, you actually, the geometry is, is much less important um, within that area. But where there's defining parts of the geometry, like this circle, uh, this circle, the square up here, um, this edge in particular going down, we want to maintain that and we want that to be as even, the most even that it can be and the most defining. But everything else in between there, you know, just do it do a quick invert selection. The faces that are selected, you know, minus, minus these guys, um, they can be, uh, they're less important to the shape. Um, and so what I wanna, uh, they're less important, but they don't need to be ugly. If that's, if that's a way to say it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is grab these edges that clearly started as like a gridded face, um, but now it's going into a circle. And I'm going to use the, um, where is it? Smooth vertex tool. And as I click that, what it's essentially doing is relieving the tension on the mesh to average out the vertices. And uh, when, you, when you see drastic movements like it did there at the beginning, that means there was a lot of tension and it's relieving that tension. And so then I'm gonna come in here and just try and, uh, you know, I don't like angles that, that kind of are sharp like this on a flat face, when it, well, when it doesn't need to be, it's not a defining feature. So I'll just, you know, massage that edge a little bit. Um, very, very subtle things. And this is kind of the best practice thing that I know that I would be, um, the model would pass in my experience, pushing it through to the modeling supervisor and into the texturing department. And there's room down here also where, uh, you know, we've got very square shapes that directly border the circle. And we can just, you know, split the difference of those edge loops and simply drag these out a little bit. Um, relieve some of that tension, which you can also do with, um, with the uh, average vertices, uh, smooth vertex, same kind of concept. So that's what I mean. Um, here's a straight edge that um, doesn't need to be straight. So let's just smooth it and split the difference between things. Whoops, didn't mean to delete that. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Now, when we exit out of it, does this look any different than what it did before when we're in the final smooth version? Frankly, no, it doesn't. Um, but here's how I figured I would explain it. Um, because this is a valid approach. What you had at the beginning is fine. Um, if, let's say, hypothetically, Nintendo contacted me before the Switch launched and they're like, hey, we want you to make a commercial or a little web you know, advertisement. I want you to model the Switch and I need it in like two hours. And I'm gonna give you uh, five grand, you know, whatever. Um, 
then I would be like, yes, I will do that. I will do it super quick. And I will end up with the topology, the, the, the topology that you had initially, and it'll totally work for the situation. That's fine. But if Nintendo came to me and was like, all right, I want you, I want you to find a team and make the definitive Nintendo Switch promotional uh, trailer. So a video with animation, you know, tight close-ups of the model, um, uh, really nice rendering and all this stuff. And, I, and you have three months to do it. Then I would, I would take my time and I would go through and make sure to polish all of these shapes off, all of the topology off. Um, and so that's an example of where both are valid, but to be its best, I, I, I was grading based on the, the best, I guess, to, to try and polish it a little bit further. Um, it's reducing, okay, from Monolorin, it's reducing stretching on the UVs and so on textures. Yeah, I believe that too. Uh, I mentioned that at, um, it wasn't uncommon for the texture department at Real Effects to send models back saying that the geometry needed to be cleaned a little bit. Um, not modified as in add new geometry or remove geometry necessarily, but like clean it up. And, um, and I think that was an example of that. Uh, all right, let me check the chat, see if I'm missing any questions so far. Okay. Let's see here. 14 minutes till it begins, right? Because it keeps changing for me. Wait a minute. Um, so Camille Jadelko, um, try refreshing the page. Because it should be live and we should be well into it. Um, and then another question is uh, from Giorgio. So should you have as many squares as possible in your model? Um, should you, okay, I think what you're asking is, should you keep all your, all your polygons as squares or as quadrilateral, as yeah, quadrilaterals, quads? Yes, so by quads, the ideal geometry for subdivision, this subsurf modifier, it works best when everything is quads. Um, that is just, uh, the formula works better there. It creates a more desired result. It's not really, it's very, it's not very likely that in all your models, they will be perfect quads. Um, so triangles aren't the devil or anything, but that is the goal. You want to err on the side of, tr of quads, not on the side of triangles or ingons. And um, is there anything else? Mostly on cylinders, you would straighten out the UVs in the UV space anyway. Um, so the la I'll, I want to end this uh, I want with the last thing to say is, again, these aren't rules as much as they're best practices. So there is room to debate and argue whether what I'm doing is really that valid. I just know from experience the expectations that was placed on me at a professional studio by modelers who had been around longer than me. And so I you know, when, when you're around that, you just kind of cater to, to what they believe is best kind of a thing. And so that's kind of habit. And, uh, but there is totally room to debate, um, whether it's necessary. And, and like in the Nintendo switch commercial example, if I've got a really tight time frame, then it makes more sense to not do the polishing pass, you know? So it's, it's situation specific anyway. All right. That's, uh, hopefully that helped. I, that would have been, that would have taken forever to type all of that in the, uh, um, chat, but uh, in the chat, in the community thread. All right, so we're back to, okay, tied up loose ends. And now we're on to week three, where the focus switches from um, refreshing the place by video is black. Deborah Douglas. Um, that's not good. Um, yeah, if we're getting any problems with the, with the stream, please let me know. That would, that would be, that would suck if, if I keep going on and it turns out no one was actually able to watch it. But, um, yeah, I hope not black. Oh, back. Oh, wow. Okay. I can't read. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Anyway, on to digital clay. So, um, we, last week we looked at a, a pretty technical, I would say technical, uh, mathematical, um, non-artistic way of modeling, which, which is mesh modeling, getting down to the base level of, of mesh components and individually moving them. Um, today, we are onto digital clay, which is digital sculpting. And I say the future is now. Um, and even though digital uh, sculpting has been around for like 10 or more years at this point, when I was first getting into 
uh, 3D an animation and computer graphics, uh, sculpting was brand new. And it blew my mind when I went from mesh modeling, trying to create characters with pushing and pulling inverts and how hard it was. And then all of a sudden I could sculpt in a way that, you know, harkened all the way back to when I'm a kid and given Play-Doh, that, that, was, that was the stuff. That was the future. That was amazing. And it still is. And it's my, by far my preferred method of creating models. Um, and so let's uh, go to the next slide. What is digital sculpting? Um, the art of manipulating verts, edges, and faces into a purposeful 3D shape. Wait a minute. If you guys watched last week, you'll know that that is the same definition I used for mesh modeling. And, and because it's true, sculpting at its core is just affecting verts, edges, and faces, just like mesh modeling. But it's a big difference when you're doing it with the interface known as brushes, which is what sculpting is all about. It's the interface, it's a different method of changing those verts, edges, and faces. So if we look at this, doing the same thing, but different, um, on the left, it's, uh, this represents mesh modeling. You're going in and picking a vertex, moving it to a certain place. I know it's not just always a single vertex. You can do a string of edges or faces, but you're essentially moving the, the basic uh, component of that mesh in a geometric way. But with sculpting, it, there's a fall off to it. And you can, um, you, you move a bunch of vertices at the same time and uh, in, a, in, a, in an art intuitive way. Now you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, that's actually just uh, proportional editing. That's also true. Proportional editing is a step in that direction, but with proportional editing, which I showed you last week, I believe, that's still just um, limited to rotation, translation, and scale. Um, so a very limited system, ultimately. Very useful in its context, but, but nowhere near as useful as sculpting. Um, because the power of brushes and... Um, and so I was thinking about brushes and how intuitive they are. Um, you know, thinking back to like when you're given, I, I, I had this example trying to explain this, like why it's intuitive more than mesh modeling. When you're a child, like my kid's two and a half, almost three years old, and um, we give him Play-Doh. What we do not give him is like, like a saw or a table saw and, and carpentry tools to actually create these rigid shapes um, because that's a technical kind of approach, it's also dangerous, but it's, it's very technical and requires kind of an adult, you know, to do those things. But you can give a kid clay and they just, they start forming it and they in, intuitively go into it. And that's why digital sculpting is so powerful. Um, so it's the power of these brushes. That is the whole system um, that's super important. Um, and, and we're gonna go into a demo here pretty soon. Um, so your, your agenda for this week is to watch the Fundamentals of Sculpting course. Um, and then the homework, I actually changed this a bit. I need to update it in the community thread. But uh, as I was going through this presentation, I figured I needed to give you a little bit more. Um, um, so I want you to do the Melvin sculpting exercise, which is part of, of the Fundamentals of Sculpting course. So there's holding your hand through that exercise. It should be um, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward after you watch this, this class today. And, uh, and then submit the exercise because you get XP, which is... Um, which is like our digital currency for um, um, for CG Cookie, but uh, um, so get you some XP and then also sculpt three primitive shapes, which is going to be the focus of the demo I'm going to do here in a few minutes. Um, the idea of uh, well sculpting primitives, you'll see what I mean. And then finally, one to three additional objects of your choice. Um, so that's a lot to do, and and the point of that is is I think what really gets you good at sculpting and comfortable is practicing. Um, uh, I want to introduce you to the tools, but to get comfortable, you need to practice, practice, practice. So that's why I wanted to give you a lot of things to practice with this week. Um, less less um, education to watch, but more um, more practice to be done. Um, knives for the kids. Assassin's Creed starts early, you know. Uh, pretty pretty funny comment. We got some jokesters in the in the uh, chat. Um, all right, cool. So uh, week three goals. Uh, understand and practice digital sculpting a lot. Again, practice, practice, practice. And then finally, consider purchasing a graphics, a graphics tablet um, because graphics ta graphic tablets are very, very 
beneficial to digital sculpting. Um, essential, you might even say. And um, a lot of people have questions about that. Can you sculpt without a tablet? Can you sculpt with a mouse? Yes, you definitely can. In fact, I use the mouse with the grab brush um, pretty frequently, intentionally with the grab brush, which you'll see in a second. But um, everything else, it's just so much more intuitive, natural to use a pen and tablet. And here's some examples online that are, are pretty inexpensive. Um, oh, I didn't actually put the price on here, but I do have the page lo loaded. So um, first we have the Wacom Intuos Draw CTL 490, a lot of letters. Um, it's only 80 bucks and it's an Amazon choice, really good reviews. I have kind of, whoops, the, the earlier equivalent of this. Um, that's what I use personally, bought for a very similar price a couple years ago. Um, so that's a good one. That's about, that's 80 bucks it looks like. And then another one that I want to recommend, um, so Wacom is is the, the leading brand. Um, it's like the Apple of, of, of tablets. And then um, uh, Huion is, is a good company. They make good tablets, but they're less expensive. Um, so this one is about is seventy seven dollars. Also, pretty good reviews for four stars, seven hundred sixty um, individual reviews. Um, but the difference is this is a bigger drawing surface. This is a ten inch by six point two five inch um, uh, drawing surface, whereas this Amazon Intuos, which is four dollars or three dollars more expensive, um, it's only a six inch by three point seven inch uh, drawing. So so it's a it's a smaller tablet. Um, uh, question, is that the Intuos 3D Core for the ZBrush Core Bundle? Is that the Intuos 3D for the ZBrush Core Bundle? I'm not sure, actually. Um, oh, I'm glad to see someone has a Huey on in here. Um, yeah, I think it's, a, re I think it's a, a, a second place to Wacom. Very reliable based on the re uh, reviews that I've watched. Um, so yeah, I, I, I highly recommend you get one of these. Or I'm not one of these, I'm sorry. There are so many reviews online. If you're gonna spend any money on something, like check the reviews, YouTube, um, you know, search best uh, tablets um, for artists, you know, stuff like that. So many resources to find a good tablet. These are just some suggestions and the one, and essentially the one that I use is this, this Wacom here. Um, but yeah, kind of a public service announcement for, for tablets. It's gonna, it's gonna be a lot less frustrating to sculpt this way than with a mouse. And with that said, yeah, it's my last slide. We're ready to jump into Blender and start uh, the demo for, for sculpting. We'll just start with a new, um, a new scene. Um, so we have two Matthews in the chat with a both who have a Huey on tablet. I'm curious if you guys like it. Um, so far, it's, you've just established that you have one. I'm curious if, they're, if you would agree that they're a pretty good, good brand still. Just gonna check through the chat a little bit, make sure I'm not missing anything. Any questions? Okay, I don't think so. All right, excellent. So what I wanted to show you today is, is go through kind of the, the essentials of sculpting, which I do in the course that I'm, I'm assigning you to watch this week as well, but I wanna also show you a demo that I didn't do there um, in that course. Um, Okay, Matthew said, I bought it specifically for Blender sculpting and I have enjoyed it so far. Excellent. Um, which one did you get, Matthew? Which, which specific model, if you don't mind sharing? And Mark Smith is saying, the drawing surface does make a big difference. Yes, Huion sells a $30. Um, oh, where is it? I can probably find it real quick if I switch. Uh, it's probably in the recommended. But they sell a $30 tablet Um, that is, I was pretty tempted when I was looking and, uh, yeah, here it is, but it's so tiny. I thought, I mean, based on the picture, it's like, I mean, sure. It looks small, but it, it looks, you know, big enough, but, it, but according to the reviews, it's so tiny that someone said it's like drawing on a, on a business card, which would be really hard to do. So you want one, you want one bigger. I wouldn't go smaller than this, the six inch by, by four inches. I wouldn't go smaller than that. Um, all right, cool. So digital sculpting, um, how to think about going into this initially. Um, we're going to start with this cube and similar to, uh, sculpting with like Play-Doh, think about the first thing that you do. You grab the clay, you start balling it up 
in and warming it up and then stretching it out usually into some tubes. Like if you're creating a character, you want to roll out um, logs of clay. Is that the, the tubes of clay? And then start cutting it up to represent the arms and the legs and stuff like, or maybe a bigger tube for the chest, the torso. Um, and so we're, we have to do that with digital clay as well, or at least with the first medium that I'm going to show you. Um, and, uh, and it's called multi-res. Uh, so we kind of have to do that with multi-res to, to give it a base mesh, to give it a basic shape um, like you would with Play-Doh. Um, because once you have that basic shape, then you have a surface to start sculpting on. And, uh, and that's important with multi-resolution. So the difference between multi-res and subsurface, if I add a subsurf modifier and crank up the views, you know, we have a lot of geometry in the end result, but we don't have access to that, high, that um, higher res geometry. We only have access to the lower res, which is very useful. Um, we saw that last week. But with sculpting and with multi-res specifically, let me add that modifier. Um, we can subdivide several times and we can actually edit on that higher subdivision level. So if we jump now to sculpt mode, which you can access down here, uh, instead of object mode, we'll jump to sculpt mode. Maybe I'll remove the uh, timeline just so we have uh, um, a little more real estate. I'm gonna check through the chat again, some, some more stuff about Huey on. I haven't really used, much, used it much yet, says Deborah. Um, I don't sculpt much, but I will start using it now. Excellent, you're prepared very well for, for this week. Um, and Matt Dickon hasn't used it too much, so far it works good. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that you have it and you, you'll be prepared to sculpt this week with that stuff. That's good. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, multi-res. I'm in sculpt mode now, and if I, uh, if I use the grab brush to move a piece of geometry, um, you can see that I'm editing the high res. I'm editing level four, and then I can jump down to level two, and, and the changes have propagated. So that's a really, really cool feature of multi-res. And multi-res, this idea of, of interactive subdivision levels is, is core to sculpting and, and the history of sculpting. It's, it's where it started. ZBrush still does it. It's, it's essentially the core um, of ZBrush still and, and Blender to a degree. So it's a very relevant um, method still, despite the dynamic topology that I'm gonna show you next. But just wanted to show you kind of historically how, how sculpting um, has progressed in its technology a little bit. And, um, and so we have multi-res here. And when I change it at the bottom level, um, like this, and, and then jump up, the uh, changes have propagated there as well. So that's a very powerful approach. Um, and so with sculpting, you need a lot of geometry um, in order to get, to get the shapes that you want. So I'm gonna subdivide all the way up till you know, I'm up at seven levels right now, and we're looking at 100,000 polygons. Now, remember, when you subdivide, it is using the Catmull clark uh, formula, and that is uh, quadrupling your polygon count with each level. So as I subdivide again, we're going to be close to, yeah, 400,000, 393,000 polygons. And um, um, if you keep going higher and higher, that's more processing power. So you want to be aware... Um, with either multi-res or dynamic topology, just aware in general when sculpting of how high in your poly count you go. Because the higher you go, you, you, risk, you risk it not being workable. Um, so for example, if I subdivide up to, um, you'll notice that the subdivision operation actually takes longer each time, but I'm gonna go up to subdivision of 10. And you'll see, you should see my little wheel pop up. Yeah. So we're at 10 subdivision levels. I can orbit around the viewport fine but we're looking at 6.2 million polygons at this stage. And when I click and drag, you can see that it lags behind. So this is what I call like not really workable. And, um, and if we look at more of a brush stroke based br uh, brush, like the clay strips, you can see how bad it lags behind. So just be aware of that. Um, you need to approach multi-res intelligently and um, um, it's more of a strategic approach to sculpting. Um, it's not complete freedom uh, because you are limited to the base mesh that you bring in. Now, this is a really random shape with just things pulled off in, in random directions. Um, whoops, I use a snake hook and, you know, this, this is a weird shape, an abstract shape. It was not ever meant uh, to come from, 
what we started with, which is a subdivided cube. So this is where the idea of a base mesh is very important for multi-res sculpting because, um, uh, I'm sorry, I had a, had a brain fart. Uh, it's important to multi-res sculpting in order to make your workflow um, as successful as it can be. With multi-res, you don't just wanna create a sphere and then try and pull a character out of that, a, a, a bipedal character out of that, or a quadruped. You don't wanna pull these legs out because it's not really meant for that. Instead, you want to create a simple base mesh, like for example, I'll, I'll open one. File import, this is coming from that library I mentioned earlier. I built this you know, more than, well, yeah, 10 years ago. So um, where did I put that? This right here. So this is a base mesh that I built a long time ago. And, you know, simple, low poly ultimately, but if I jump into um, a multi-res modifier and subdivide it, now the sculpture has far more context for its subdivision, and it'll be an easier process to sculpt. Um, but it is limited to the type of base mesh, and you need to be strategic with what you bring in. And I saw a question real quick. I want to answer that before I lose it. Um, oh, Matthew, you said you've got the 610 Pro. That's the one. I, I bought my father that one as well. He was getting into digital painting. Um, so cool. I, I, thought, I, I saw good reviews on the 610. Huey on 610. Um, I could have sworn I saw a question. Huh, nope, no question marks. Oh wait, here, here we go. When sculpting, does Blender uses one core or uh, does it go multi-core? That's a good question. Um, I believe by default it's on multi-core because if we go to the option panel in sculpt mode, there's this threaded sculpt, which yeah, take advantage of multiple CPU cores to improve sculpting performance. This is on by default. And so in that sense, yes, it is, it is taking advantage if you have a multi-core system um, to make your sculpting as, as uh, um, responsive, uh, as efficient as possible. Now, on, since we're in this panel, the options panel, there's another one in here called Fast Navigate. And we don't really have this problem right now. Our, our geometry, we're able to navigate the viewport quite well. Um, can sculpting use GPUs? To my knowledge, not in Blender. Um, I think it's just CPU as far as I know. Uh, if anyone else knows differently, let, uh, please let me know. In, or let us know in the chat. Um, but with fast navigate on, what, what the idea is, when I orbit around the model, you'll see that it down reses just during the, the orbiting or, or the viewport navigation. When I stop it, it pops back up. And this can be helpful um, whenever you're sculpting to speed up your system. Like so while I'm on this topic of, of working efficiently, I personally have tested Blender up with multi-res. Multi-res is actually computed faster than dynamic topology. Um, but I've been up to 24 million polygons with multi-res and it's still been workable, but just barely. And by workable, I was, I was adding high res, um, texture detail with a stamp, um, which is beyond the course. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, that's okay. But I was able to work with 24 million polygons by adding those stamp textures. Stamps are useful if you want to add like skin pores or, or details like that from an image, um, and so I've been as high as 24 million. Dynamic topology, I've been as high as like 6 million, maybe 10 million, and then it, re it really starts to struggle once it gets up there. But um, if you work smart and intelligently, you won't really need the, uh, it doesn't matter about those millions of polygons, frankly. Um, ZBrush touts the ability to do millions, even billions of polygons, and that's, that's awesome that it can do that. ZBrush is great. It's the only, it's the only 3D app I've purchased um, outright. So uh, it's a great app. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it, but you really, if you work smart, you just don't need that much polygons, that, that much topology. I mean, unless you're sculpting the Rocky mountains, you know, at scale, um, in the computer with all its detail for some reason, but, um, I've never had to, had to use that many polygons. Um, cool. I haven't missed any questions yet. Uh, yeah. If you, you this should be you know, open knowledge at this point, but if you have questions, let them rip. There are no dumb questions. I'm here to answer your questions. Um, it's a big reason I'm here. So um, I remember a time, Omar saying, I remember a time when 2 million polys uh, in Blender was enough to crash it. Wow, yeah, I I can't say I remember, remember it being that low, but I believe it. I mean, I wonder how many years ago that was, Omar. So a question from J-Mac. Um, 
sorry I had to step away, no big deal. If I recall correctly, in CG Cookie sculpting tutorials, you recommend starting with low vertices, but I've seen you on YouTube um, where they would start with high vertices. Um, yeah, so um, it depends on what you mean by low, or really what it means by high. For example, um, I, we can segue into the di dynamic topology um, you know, portion of this demo. And uh, if, if, if I'm gonna start with dynamic topology, I usually like to add a cube or a UV sphere. And um, actually, I'm gonna start with an icosphere for demonstration. Um, so we're starting with an icosphere. And if I were to start sculpting like a human head off of this, before I go to sculpt mode, I like to, oh crap, um, let me try that again. Before I move the icosphere, I like to uh, increase the subdivisions to give it more geometry. Just, I like to start with dynamic topology that way. Now I'm not cranking it up to, you know, craziness like 10, that's, that's, that's not needed. Um, but just a little more than, than what it starts at. To me, this is just a little too, too few. I mean, it's not too few, this is preferential, frankly, because dynamic topology will make this exactly what it needs to be, whatever you want it to be. But I just like to start with a range like this. So in that way, I, I, I see, like starting high, but I'm, I'm not in like, the, I'm not starting with like hundreds of thousands of polygons or anything like that. Um, um, yeah, Mark, you said ZBrush is not working the same as Blender when it comes to uh, poly count. Yeah, ZBrush is actually, I think the last time I checked, it was not technically a 3D program. It was like 2.5D. So it's like some bizarre format for, it, um, you know, creating perceptibly 3D geometry. It, ZBrush is a wild program. It is, it stands alone in what it can do and how it was built. Um, okay, cool. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, so we're we're into the dynamic topology portion of the demo. And and so dynamic topology came second. It's the newer technology in, in, uh, in sculpting. And for dynamic topology, it's, it's so freeing. It, it's, it's the freest way to sculpt. You can literally bring in any object and start creating from it. The base mesh doesn't matter, frankly. Um, it has to exist, there has to be something, so you can't just start sculpting from nothing. You, so add a primitive, um, but then from there, we jump to sculpt mode, and dynamic topology lives in the tools. Down here at the, uh, towards the middle of the stack, uh, just turn on dynamic topology. And um, you know, with the default settings, I'm using a snake hook brush. I also wanna turn on wireframe for this. And notice as I pull geometry out, it's creating new geometry. Like, I hope that strikes you as crazy because the technology is, is a few years old, but it still blows my mind because I sculpted so long with just multi-res. Um, so this is phenomenal. It's literally limitless clay. Um, and so, I mean, you can, you can, with this method, base mesh doesn't matter and you can sculpt a character um, from nothing. Um, that's the big difference between dynamic and, and multi-res. It's dynamically tessellating your model if we switch to clay strips, dynamically tessellating the model, giving it the amount of geometry it needs based on parameters, but for whatever whatever you're trying to, to sculpt. Um, yeah, hey, LJ Simpson, that's crazy. Thank you. Uh, I think it's crazy too. It's phenomenal technology. Nicholas Bishop, I believe, is the, the one who, who really put this into Blender. So he's kind of like a celebrity, you know, like a godfather of Blender development because of this feature. Um, so yeah, that's dynamic topology at its core, dynamically giving you the geometry you need to create your sculpture. And let's go over some of the settings, the core settings, which is detail size. This determines how big or small the new topology faces are. So it starts at 12. If we go higher than 12, like 20, um, and use the flatten brush, for example, you'll see our geometry lessens. You, um, the faces get bigger. And it keeps the shape as best it can, but it, it uh, the amount of faces uh, diminishes. Whereas if I go smaller than 12, like five, we have a lot more faces. So this is how you um, can create localized high detail versus, um, uh, sorry, localized high detail right beside of, of low res detail. This is something you cannot do with multi-res. With multi-res, if I needed to add a really fine detail in here, 
the only answer is to add another subdivision. So I can achieve a small detail, like let's just say like a nipple on this guy. Um, but the cost is to quadruple that topology, that, that poly count, if not more. And you have all this unneeded geometry everywhere else. So that's, you know, hopefully I'm painting a good picture of what is really different about these two. Um, and so, okay, we've, we've covered detail size. Let's go back there. Um, lower numbers are, are smaller um, polygons, meaning more polygons. Higher numbers are less polygons. Um, that setting seems a little counterintuitive. Yeah, um, so the, the way I think of it, and it does change actually, there's one method where it goes the opposite direction. Um, so what you can see that it says 5.0 pixels, and think of it that way. Whenever you go smaller pixels, it's saying that the edge, the edge it created right here, when it, when it dynamically tessellated, that is five pixels big, five pixels long, um, based on the, can the viewport. All right, so five pixels in the viewport, that's how many pixels, uh, that's how long the edge is. Does, does that make sense? In that way, it does make sense to me. So if I bump up to 20 pixels, that means the settings are um, bigger, uh, more pixels per edge. And that's why you get uh, larger topology. Um, which sidebar, uh, you'll notice that when I did that, we got some bad geometry happening. Um, it, in that case, if, if I have bad geometry like this, I just need to retessellate it. So I'm holding shift and smoothing it out and then retessellating it and eventually it'll be gone. Um, so again, that process is, is like, it's hard to recreate bad geometry, but um, um, you know, it's smoothing and um, retessellating. The way I like to retessellate is with any um, brush that modifies tessellation, just make the strength really low and that will still, it'll affect the tessellation without affecting the shape. Um, but yeah, sometimes you can run into bad geometry with, with, uh, dynamic topology. So that's the detail size. Um, and the next method is, uh, or the next thing that affects the method of tessellation is subdivide collapse, um, or the, or the detail refine method. And the default is subdivide collapse. So what this does is it, it gives geometry, well, it, it retessellates the geometry regardless, um, and, uh, and that's really great for starting out a sculpture, but where it does not work well is let's say for some reason, I just really felt the need to, to put a, an eye hole in here, a nice high res high eye hole for some reason. And um, at this point, I think you get the idea. We don't really need the wire frame necessarily showing. Um, so I've got this eye hole and, and I really needed to put that at this stage in the sculpture not, not, not much else is formed, um, but then I, uh, so I zoom out and I wanna address the rest of the sculpture. If I touch this area, it remeshes. And, um, and especially if I'm using a higher uh, pixel because you'll change the detail size. It's not something you just leave, you change it progressively. You go back and you go forth as needed. And so if I go backward to a higher value, it's going to remesh that area and the majority of the shape is gone. Um, so that's that's something to keep in mind with subdivide collapse. Sometimes that's desired, sometimes it's not. If I don't want that to happen, I'm gonna skip down to subdivide edges. And what this does is it only re, re um, it only retessellates the geometry if the face that it's touching is um, or the face that it's affecting has an edge that's greater than the value set in the detail size. Okay, so uh, these faces in here are far under the pixel size of 10. And so if I touch it, it's not retessellating it. But over here, these polygons are above 10. And if I touch it, um, it does retessellate, as you can see there. Um, so that's subdivide edges. That's a, it, practically speaking, it's a good way to um, sculpt dynamically and get new geometry as needed, but not... Um, not nuke the geometry that you already like, the smaller, finer details. A hotkey for detail size. Shoot, I know it has one. I think it does. Okay, I'm not seeing one here. Um, th that might come from the pie menus, which kind of embarrassing, embarrassingly, I've never done the pie menus in Blender. I think they're great, and I, it's kind of like a to-do list. Oh yeah, at some point, modify your workflow to do the pie, the pie menus, but I don't, I don't know of a way to affect the detail size. Can someone help me there? Is there a hotkey? I'm not seeing one in the tooltip. 
Um, so I usually, uh, I change it manually here. I kind of have numbers that I know. I, I, I like to start at 10. Um, and then when I get into higher frequency details, I like to go to five. And those are pretty much where I hang out. Um, but uh, between five and 10. But then sometimes I'll go as low as two for super high detail. But mainly I'm just between five and 10. And so that's why I don't have a hot key. Or I, I mean, I don't really see much of a need to have a hot key for me personally. But actually, yeah, I wonder how the hot key would work if I press a key and then a value window pops up and I type it in manually. Anyway. I'm not sure of a detail size hotkey, um, but I hover around 10 to start off with and five for the details. So that's subdivide edges. The other method is collapse edges. And what this one does, um, let me turn on the wireframe again. Uh, what this one does is it tries to make our geometry consistent with the detail size value. And then once it makes that geometry consistent, it doesn't um, affect the geometry anymore. So I'm using the inflate brush and here, Let's see, I might need to go to five. Wait a minute, why isn't this doing anything? Okay, that, there's an example, huh? Let me think about this. So it seems to take, if we hover over it, collapse short edges is to remove mesh detail where possible. So this is trying to eliminate, let's say I accidentally made these eye holes too high res. Um, like I, I, I added more geometry than I needed then I can use the collapse edges to define a new detail size, like 10, and then sculpt over that area and it will redefine it, but it won't keep generating it. Like I keep clicking and it's not regenerating new topology because it's made that geometry consistent in the first place. So honestly, I, I use subdivide collapse usually starting off whenever I'm sculpting more gesturally, um, but then I switch to subdivide edges whenever I have features or details that I want to preserve. Um, for the for the rest of the sculpture, that's when I'll switch to subdivide edges. Also, you'll see during the demo, um, the, the latter half of the demo, um, subdivide edges, if you want sharp, crisp edges, that's how you do it. Um, you don't do it with, uh, you can't really do it with uh, subdivide collapse. Um, and then collapse edges, if I'm honest, I don't think I've ever used that brush or that, that method. Um, but, you know, it's there. It, it's just, I can do... I guess what it did, I can kind of do with subdivide collapse. But anyway, the third option is relative detail. This is how it determines the relation of this value. So relative detail is the default and it was it's the longest, it was there in the beginning of this tool. Um, and so I got used to it then and that's why I keep it, but they added two more which are useful. But relative detail is according to the viewport. Okay, it's relative to the viewport. So if I'm further away from the model, 10 pixels, looks like this, but if I'm closer to the model, 10 pixels, um, I'm on collapse edges, 10 pixels looks like this, okay? Same value, but it's just practically, it's, it, it's like how close or far away you are to the model. So whenever I want to make broad strokes, I simply zoom out and then make, uh, make a shape. Um, but then when I want fine detail, I zoom in and consider making finer detail like this. So that is practically how I use relative detail. Um, the other methods, constant detail, is it's, it's based on the world. So no matter if I'm far away, um, let's, oh, oh, you saw here the, the resolution changed. Um, I think this is in blender units. Uh, maximum edge length for dynamic topology as, okay, divisor of a blender unit. High values mean smaller edge length. So this means uh, it's the opposite effect as, as the, other, the other values, the pixel values. So, um, you know, if I want bigger polygons, I'm gonna go higher. And at 10, that's apparent, okay, that's apparently 10. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm, I, I told you wrong. I wasn't expecting that. Why wasn't I expecting that? So lower values are bigger. Yeah, interesting. Lower, it's kind of like, texture values, you know, like when you scale texture coordinates, um, going higher actually makes the scale of the texture go down. So anyway, um, for constant detail and blender unit based resolution, lower values means higher polygons, um, but it's consistent no matter if I'm this far away, it's still the same um, size of geometry, whether I'm this close, same size of geometry. So that's the, the constant detail. 
And then, um, and again, like going up in value is, is how you get more polygons. So maybe a little more intuitive. Someone mentioned that it was not intuitive. Um, oh, and I missed a question. Hold on a second. Let me go down, try and catch up a little bit. Hotkey for detail size. Uh, I meant the subdivide collapse change. Um, so kill zone again about the, uh, wait a minute, I'm confused. If you were asking if there's a hotkey for the subdivide collapse change, I, I don't think so. I don't see any hotkeys here, but there might be some in the pie menus. So look into the pie menus. I, I, I don't use pie menus, but um, they're very good. Um, I like the concept. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, do you wait, and so from LJ Simpson, do you wait until you complete the sculpt before working on UVs? Yeah, that's a whole nother can of worms or something better than worms, that sounds bad. That's a whole nother workflow for what you do after you sculpt. And I, I personally think it's a little beyond this beginner um, workflow. So I'm not giving you any of this work, but we'll talk about it next week and, and I'll mention it now. But um, basically when you sculpt, that's all it is. You, you, it's not practical to, to use this sculpture for uh, animation. Um, it's always way too high density of a mesh. Um, the topology is bad. I mean, this when I say bad topology, certain topology works better for animation. Other topology does not work better. This, this triangulated mess is bad for topology. It's only a mess in the context of it being useful for animation. So once you finish your sculpture, you don't, you don't even, I don't address UVs until I've built a better model, which is based on this concept of retopology. I'll talk more about that later, but it's, um, so to answer your question, do you wait until you complete the sculpt before working on UVs? Um, yes, I will answer yes to that because if you lay out the UVs of this mesh, all it takes is one change in topology and those UVs are, are broken essentially. So um, especially with dynamic topology, you do not want to affect um, the topology after you lay out UVs. With multi-res, it's a little different. You can lay out UVs, I guess, beforehand, as long as you don't change the underlying topology, uh, which does bring up a point that um, it's dangerous to affect the topology. So on this mesh, if I extrude up like this, now it worked in this case, um, but it is dangerous. Like, let's say if I Apparently, you know, it can work well. I've seen it break when you change the topology, um, even with extrusions like this, but let's, it worked fine here, but let's say I wanted to delete that face and then fill it again. Um, that worked fine. Uh, it's, it's totally broken my sculpture before to do that kind of thing. Um, so it, with multi-res best practice, you don't really want to change the topology unless you absolutely have to and you're willing to risk breaking it or creating more work for yourself. Um, it's funny that that, that worked so well, um, no problem whatsoever, but trust me, that can, that can break it. But in, in dynamic topology, you can change the topology all you want and uh, it's gonna be fine uh, when you start going back to sculpting. Uh, yeah, Mark Smith, that's a very concise way to say UV is concerned after read topology. Good one, I mean, much better way to say that. Uh, sculpt detail size hotkey is shift D. Thank you, Matthew. How have I not known that? Let me see here. So sculpt shift D. Holy cow. Yeah. Look at that. I'm at, you can see the resolution. If you look in the bottom corner here, it tells you what resolution you're at. So if I, I like to do relative detail at 10 pixels, shift D. Wow. So it's super sensitive considering I want to go down to 10, I recommend holding shift. So hit shift D, hold shift, because that creates finer increments of change. So yeah, shift D is how you do the detail size. Thank you to Matthew Ulray for, for shouting that out to us. Why in the world is that not offered here in the, um, what if I right click? Yeah, that's funny. There's nothing to indicate that's the hotkey in the tool itself, in the parameter, interesting. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, and M. Jans, thank you too. Um, I should have known that is what I, I get the impression of. Um, okay, a question from Matthew Gayton. Would you use the sculpt to get a high res normal for texture 
and and lower res retopology. Yeah, that's a that's a great use case for sculpting. Is sculpt a high the highest detailed version of of your character, uh, and the best way you get to high detail is with uh, with sculpt sculpt tools. So create that high detail. You retopologize a low res version of that model, um, and then you bake maps from the high res to the low res. That is a very very common workflow and benefit of sculpting. Um, so yes. All right, um, we've talked about all the, let's see, I said relative detail, constant detail, brush detail, that's the last one. This one is relative to the size of your brush. So if I want higher um, values, or I want bigger polygons during my tessellation, I increase the size of the brush. Um, let's, uh, let's use in inflate, and you can see it, it uh, Sorry, I'm getting lost in my head. It creates those bigger to, uh, bigger polygons. And then if I decrease the size of my brush, which by the way, F is the hotkey that I'm um, adjusting the size of the brush. Uh, inc decrease the size of the brush and we get uh, more polygons. So th that's a pretty intuitive one. Um, and then at that point, you don't necessarily need to change the detail percentage, but you know, you can. Um, all right, cool. So that's kind of the core settings. Uh, you can like smooth shading if you want. Uh, I used to use that, but I stopped using it because um, you know, you're dealing with so many polygons, it usually looks smooth. Like take this for example, this is a faceted mesh, but because it's so many polygons, it, it looks smooth. And I think using the smooth shading toggle tends to slow down, or at least it used to slow down um, dynamic sculpting just a little bit. So I, I just turn it off. Um, then we have optimize, which um, if we hover over the tooltip, uh, it says recalculate the sculpt BVH to improve performance. All that, all you need to know there is if your dynamic topology sculpt starts to bog down a little bit and you feel like it's not too high res, like it's not in the 6 million, 10 million poly range, or even if it is, you know, get in the habit of, of first clicking on optimize because it'll try and you know, rebuild that BVH, whatever. It'll, it'll try and refresh the underlying um, calculation so that it can, can be faster and more optimal. Um, yeah, um, so that's the optimize. And then finally, we've got symmetrize, which, which um, even though I've got symmetry enabled, that's another feature I haven't talked about. By default, you can see that we have X symmetry enabled. So whatever I do on one side, it's done to the other as well. Um, that's on by default. The problem, well, sometimes a problem with dynamic topology is it doesn't, um, even though the stroke is mirrored, the topology that's generated is not mirrored. And so we can use the symmetrize button to create perfectly symmetrical geometry. And you should have, it should have been obvious when it did that. Um, so that's the benefit of symmetry. Sometimes you want that. Um, but it's just there in case you do. And, um, or so a lot of times actually where it's maybe more practical is at some point I'll turn off mirror and I'll just start, um, you know, sculpting on one side, forgetting about the other side, kind of getting tunnel vision. And then I zoom out and I'm like, oh no, I, I didn't get that side for free. And so you can symmetrize. And in that case, I went from this side and mirrored that way. But if you change negative x to positive x, if you change that to positive x to negative x, you'll get symmetry in the other direction. Um, all right, so that was all the, the core tools of the core, well, the core features and parameters of dynamic topology. And so that's a lot of talking about the tools. Now I wanna actually sculpt something and, and talk about the art of sculpting, the, the, the process of sculpting. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, so far? Oh yeah, we do from Omar. Um, I kind of remember there is a setting on user preferences, VBO. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, as far as I know, VBOs is specifically related to uh, multi-res modifiers. So if I bring up our user preferences um, and look at, is it system? I thought it was system. Wait a minute. Did they remove that? You know, they might have removed that. There used to be a VBO system, I feel like. Well, I know that I've clicked on it, but it was right in here in the OpenGL. 
Um, yeah, they must have moved it, or or maybe they made it default. I think I remember something about that. There, there was this setting called VBOs, and it was it was a kind of a tool to to make sculpting faster. And I think that yeah, I think they removed it. I haven't seen it in a while. So I think that um, it might be the default now, and it doesn't give you the option. It just assumes that you want it on. But as far as I remember on that topic, it only affected uh, multi-res. It made that faster. Um, and I think I've already said it, but uh, multi-res, you are able to handle more polygons with multi-res sculpting than you do with dynamics poly, uh, dyna dynamic topology. Um, and um, the last thing I'll say, it, so far I've, I've talked about the two mediums is what I call it. Multi-res being one medium of sculpting, kind of like, you know, Sculpey clay and then dynamic topology is like monster clay. You know, they're different mediums. Um, um, but they, they're not, it's not like you choose one or the other and that's it. Uh, I actually like to strategically use both. Uh, and you'll see in, in my, in a lot of my sculpting training, I will sculpt like 50 to 75% of a, of a character with dynamic topology. And then I will retopologize that character. And then on the retopology, I will sculpt the fine details. And so I use both in conjunction. They're not enemies or, you know, you have to go one or the other. You can work and, and take advantage of both of them. Um, but if I were to, t you can't turn, you, can't, you cannot turn uh, dynamic topology on for this. You can see that it removes the modifier. You can see it not supported in dynamic topology. So you can't use both at the same time. Um, okay, so let's get on with the second part of the demo. And uh, I want I want you to, I would like for you guys to try this for your homework. And it's the idea of sculpting. Um, uh, I'm gonna use a, I'm gonna create an icosphere. And what I wanna do is sculpt it into a cube and basically take certain primitive shapes sculpted into other primitive shapes. And that'll teach you about the tools and kind of, you know, be something fun to play around with to get used to the system. Um, let's see, so Omar, do you have a favorite YouTube video or someone sculpting something awesome? Oh man, just a favorite. Uh, that was that question, by the way. Um, man, it's been a long time. Uh, it's been a long time since I, I really sat back and watched like a time-lapse sculpting or tutorial. Um, but I, I mean, I used to watch a lot back in the day. I don't know, it's a good question. Maybe I'll, uh, if you wanna know, maybe I can dig some up for you, but I can't think of one off the top of my head that's like, you gotta watch that. There's so many good sculptors out there that it's hard. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find a bad one, but um, sorry, I, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a per personal favorite, you know, person that I watch uh, sculpting time-lapses, but. Um, all right, so yeah, I wanna, what I wanna do is turn this icosphere using dynamic topology. I, I do recommend that you start sculpting with dynamic topology. Even though I told you about multi-res first, just because it was chronological and history, it came first. It's the older of the technologies. I recommend you start with dynamic topology because it's very much, again, like taking a ball of Play-Doh and just going to town. Way more intuitive. So. Um, Really, you can turn it on and leave the settings as is, as uh, as it is at the default, and you can start sculpting right away. Um, okay, so now you might have heard me, like I just moved my mouse off of my tablet and I've got my pen in hand. So uh, I'm gonna get right down to, to sculpting this using the pen and tablet. And I wanna create a cube out of this, this shape. I've enabled dynamic topology, and this is actually an example where I can enable symmetry in the X, Y, and Z axis, which is pretty cool. You don't get an opportunity to do that too often. Mostly it's just X, mostly it's just X. Occasionally you can get another axis. But um, for this shape, we can. And, and so think about how, like what you would do to create a cube. You know, the, the biggest defining factor that we're missing in the, in the sphere is the hard edges. And so look into the brushes and they they should make much more sense to you. I, I was thinking about this earlier. Like if I compared the mesh modeling, if I went in and told my wife or said like, "Hey, um, see if you understand one better than the other." I, I need to create a hard edge, and I'm going to add holding edges on either side to reinforce that shape to create a sharp edge. She'd probably look at me blankly. But then if I said, "I need to create a hard edge," which brush should I use? 
she would probably be able to pick the crease brush. Um, so, you know, everything about sculpting, in my opinion, is much more intuitive. Um, and we're going to use the crease brush uh, to create these hard edges. But there is a catch with the, with the default crease brush settings. Um, all of our brushes, as far as I know, um, look down here at this setting right here, the add versus the subtract. Pretty much all our brushes has add as the default option, except for crease. That changes to subtract. And so that bothers me because um, when everything is consistent in the viewport, I can always know that holding control will push inward, whereas holding nothing and just drawing the, the stroke pushes outward, and except for crease, and then it, it's the opposite all of a sudden. So I recommend changing that to add, um, just so that it's consistent and you know what to expect when you're switching through all your brushes. But with the crease brush set to add, um, oh, also another hotkey that I haven't mentioned yet um, is Shift F. That determines the strength of the brush. Hold sh or hit Shift F, and then you can see that number, that strength from zero to one start to uh, be visible there, and you can establish it. Um, and so I'm just going to make it a lower strength with a broader brush and start drawing a cube, the cube edges. Focusing a little more effort into the corners. And then holding shift, you can start to smooth out some of these. Um, well, holding shift is what enables the, sh the smooth brush. But so far, I just used two brushes, the crease, smooth in between. Focus your crease on the corners to get those, because that is where the, the, the majority of of the transformation from sphere to cube happens is actually on the corner. So we'll focus more of our, our stroke there. And already we've got, you know, a fairly convincing cube. But then we have a bulge here, some leftover shaping from the, from the roundness of the sphere. So I'm gonna hit G to go to the grab brush. A couple of these brushes have hotkeys like G for grab. Um, and then I can just click and drag to make, uh, to make that more flat. And then look around from different angles, see if that's a relevant approach anywhere else. Okay, so the edge looks good, but you can see that the fall off kind of gave us this, this little divot in there. Let's undo. Try that again, to smooth it out. Okay, so we've used so far the crease brush the smooth brush, which you kind of always use, and now the grab brush. Um, the next one that I want to do is sharpen up these edges with, a, with the pinch brush, which can be enabled with the P hotkey. Also, you can just always go and select it manually. Now, remember what I said earlier, if I were to um, pinch this, you can see that I keep pinching harder and harder and harder and harder, but the geometry keeps regenerating itself and it's not as sharp as it can be. So you can't really use the pinch brush too well with subdivide collapse. You want to change that to subdivide edges. And that will pinch your edge nice and tight. The more you pinch, the tighter it gets. So I'm going to pinch all of my edges. It's so nice that the symmetry gives me everything for free on the other sides. Smooth in between. Then looks like the grab brush needs to be used again to pull this out. Um, and it, uh, so I used to sculpt with ZBrush and then when I switched to Blender, the first thing that bothered me about sculpting in here was the grab brush. Because in ZBrush, it wasn't really a problem just to click here and bring out just the center. But in Blender, you get this artifact left over from the fall off of the, of the curve. This brings up another aspect of brushes each brush you can affect this thing called the curve, which is the fall off rate. And to match more ZBrush's behavior, I always take the grab brush and move this, uh, this point closer to the corner. And that creates a much more intuitive um, uh, grab brush experience. Grab brush experience, that's a funny way to say that. Um, so I recommend doing that too with the grab brush, it'll feel more natural. Um, and then, so this is pretty much done, except I don't like the roundedness of that corner. The pinching tends to do that when you're pinching 
along this way and then this way and this way. In the middle, it's, all these verts are kind of pulled every which way. So hitting the crease brush and then touching it on that corner will bring it back out. And you know, we have a cube of sorts. It's not perfect because we're basically hand creating a cube. But, um, you know, it's been pretty good. It's pretty good for practice as an exercise. But, you know, like if you, depending on how perfect you want to get it, uh, just keep playing with it. Try and make all your edges as straight as possible, your sides as flat as possible. If you, you know, we have, guess what? We have a flattened brush. Um, again, very intuitive naming here for the most part. And you can flatten out your geometry. Flatten and smooth is a good a good combination here. So I'll do flatten for a bit and then I'll hold shift and smooth it out. And uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good. I mean, it's passable. So I think I missed a couple questions here. Let me check in the chat. Um, does the grab brush work like proportional editing? Yes. Uh, grab brush is exactly like proportional editing. Um, yeah, Giannis, that's exactly right. Um, I remember an old sci-fi weapon tutorial did um, all sculpted. Then Jonathan did the retopo. Anything like that on the horizon. It's funny you mentioned that, Omar. We just brought that course back um, like a day or so ago. So that's now part of the the library again. We maybe got a little overzealous when we, when we I don't know if it was with six. It might have been with six. It must have been with six. Yeah, when we migrated our information over to six, all our content, I think we got a little overzealous with like eliminating content that was older than a certain eight, you know, age. And, um, and so we brought, we're starting to bring some of that content back. The content that we feel like is still relevant and the tools didn't change that much. Um, and that's one of the courses. It's the, I can show you, I can navigate there. Um, let's see, it should be on the front page. Go back to my mouse. I used to be able to, I used to use my pen and tablet for everything and na you know, navigation and clicking around on my desktop and stuff, but those days have come and gone. Oh, there it is right there. Hard surface sculpting and retopology. So this is the course you're talking about, I believe. And um, yeah, so we did bring that back and, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to wait till the end, but I wanted to pick you guys' brain about the next class I'm going to do. It, the one I was thinking about was actually based on this. So, um, Anyway, go back to Blender. Have I missed any other questions? Matthew's asking, or Matthew, two Matthews. Matthew Ulrich is asking, is there a way to use the grab brush along the normal of the surface or directly towards the camera? Yes. Yes, you can. Let's, let's see here. It's a little funky if I recall. I think it's, you use the grab brush and I believe you change the stroke method to be anchored. And now when you click and drag, nope. Um, wait a minute. I know I've done this before. Strength, radius, normal weight. How much grab will pull vertices out of a surface during a grab? Ah, you can hold control to grab along the normals. Thank you. I knew it had something to do with control. Yikes. Um, okay, so forget anchored. Let's just do, what was the space is the default, I think, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I knew it had something to do with holding control. Yeah, that's it. Um, thank you, Cody. That's very helpful. So holding control at any point, let's try it on the corner. And yeah, that will bring it out. Whoa, kind of freaking out on me. How about with my pen? Holding control, pushing in and out. Why is that freaking out so much? Huh, maybe it's kind of having a hard time calculating the exact normal. Uh, anyway, yeah, hold control, click and drag. Sweet. Thank you, thank you, Cody. Um, all right, so yeah, we've got one primitive down. Uh, I'll only keep you guys for about another 10 or 12 minutes. Um, I should be able to sculpt these other two in that in that amount of time. So we've got a cube, and then from here, I'm gonna duplicate this with Shift D in object mode. And I'm gonna turn this back into a sphere. So sculpt mode, we've got enable, dynamic topology enabled, symmetry, all of that's still on. And, uh, and so I'm gonna use the flatten brush. I just kind of know that preeminently. You might think, 
well, let's just use the, the smooth brush. And let's try that. I'm holding shift. We're just smoothing, smoothing, smoothing. And we're getting there. It's starting to look more like a dice, a die. Whoa, whoa, a, a singular die, you know, that you play games with. Um, and so you're, you'll notice that you're, you're smoothing, your averaging of your vertices kind of reaches a limit and you can just sit here and do it all day. But if you take the flatten brush, that's how you're gonna actually make a bigger difference. So, you know, I'm flattening, basically reversing what I just did for the, oh no. I thought, sorry, I thought Blender was gonna crash on me mid-demo, but it did not. Um, also, while I'm, while I'm smoothing this down, I'm still using subdivide edges. And remember that does not recalculate geometry that's lower than the value I set in the detail size. And all of our topology is lower than that. So we're kind of, we have a, an overload, um, a surplus of topology. So I'm gonna switch this back to subdivide collapse to reduce our geometry back to a more digestible amount. Okay, now you can see that the also the effect of, of the brush on lower topology is greater. Um, and so now I'm just gonna go in between flatten and smooth, just flattening and then holding shift to smooth it out. And uh, unfortunately it's not as simple as literally just smoothing, smoothing, smoothing. Um, but hence the purpose of the exercise to kind of try and create a sphere from a non-sphere by hand. I mean, there's stuff to learn in that, that exercise. So if I look from the top, it's actually an oval. I need to take my grab brush, increase the radius, pull that out. Ugh. Okay, so this brings up why I often use a mouse for the grab brush. You can see that as I grab it, the process of me lifting my pen off of the surface usually ends up being a, a modification. And that's not what I want. So with the mouse, it's very linear. It's very, you know, uh, let go of the click and it's done. So I'll now I've switched back to my mouse and I can drag to exactly where I want it and then just let go. So that's why I often, if I'm doing a lot of grabbing, I'll just do it with the mouse. And then one last thing I wanna bring up is I personally do not like Blender's, um, I, I like it for prettiness, but I don't like it for usability. Um, the, the display OpenGL lighting. If we open up our user preferences, um, over here in the system tab, we've got this solid OpenGL lights. And by de this is the default, there's three on with some different color and, and the combination of these three lights makes for a pretty, you know, uh, well, a pretty result, but um, it's a little too flattering. Uh, Maya and I think 3ds Max by default has one light and it is the, a headlight. So it's, it's, the, it's like a camera flash that's on constantly. And just like in real life, flash photography is is a very unflattering type of lighting. And and while that isn't great for people who want to look good in photos, it's great for your for modeling because you want to see as you're working on it, you want to see it in its worst light. Because if you get it to look it's if you get it to look good in its worst light, it's going to look great in its best light. And so this is a very common way to look at at or to interact with 3D geometry based on other programs. And so I like to do that with Blender. It's what I have set as the default. And it, what it helps to do is outline, you know, um, problems in the geometry, problem areas, little dimples and stuff. It's much more apparent here with a, with a headlight type lighting than it is with the Blender default. And so I'm actually pretty happy with this sphere at this point. There's always going to be little dimples being hand done. Um, you know, it's shrinking down the... Uh... Oh, here's another, here's another tip. Um, so when I hold shift, you know, that's going to be like second nature to you to, to hit shift anytime you want to smooth something when you're sculpting. But by default, I believe that the, the strength you set on your brush is not consistent with the, with the smooth brush by holding shift. Um, um, so you have to enable that in the options. Yeah. So you can unify the settings of size, strength, and color. I, I always recommend enabling strength. That way, again, it's the same idea as, as what I told you to do with the crease brush, like make the parameters of your brushes consistent so you can, so the behavior is consistent as you switch between brushes. Like I, what I was doing there before I enabled that is I was, you know, um, 
I had the grab brush. And so I was shift F to make my strength very, very low. But then as I was clicking, uh, holding shift and clicking, the effect of the smooth brush was still very strong. And so there was a disconnect. Those things were not, those parameters were not linked. Now they're unified. And so if I have my brush set to a low strength, the smooth will be at a low strength. You can see barely anything's happening. At a high strength, now my smooth has a lot more strength. So I recommend that. It's in options, unify settings. By default, it has size. I also recommend turning on strength. That's how I like to work. All right, so a few more minutes left. And uh, have I missed any questions? Uh, Omar, I did not know that trick about the OpenGL lights. That's pretty cool. Um, well, that's cool for me too, Omar, because you're, you've listened to me a lot. You've been around a long time. If I hear that you learned something, I consider that a victory. Um, kill zone. Isn't that what mat caps are for? To identify and read the surface better. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, I, so I like to change just in general in Blender. I like to change my viewport to look like this, regardless of if I'm sculpting or not, though it does help in sculpting. But what you're talking about, if anyone doesn't know, mat caps are also for that purpose. Um, and they're available here in the in panel or the view properties down uh, under shading. You can enable this matte cap and that's a word from ZBrush. And it's this, it's basically mapping this image onto our model. And somehow it creates um, a shading like effect. Like it almost looks like a material, like a shiny material here. And um, you know, this might be a case if I'm looking at the imperfections specifically, maybe turn on uh, smooth shading. And uh, let's see, why didn't that seem to do anything? Okay, there we go. All right, so these matte caps, as you switch between them, you know, some of them highlight problems areas in different ways than, than others. But yeah, you can use matte caps very much for uh, identifying, look at all the dimples here. This one is great, but, but don't kill yourself over these. Like you're always gonna have dimples when you're trying to create a sphere. Um, you know, so it's not the purpose is not to be perfect, but it's to teach you the tools. But yeah, play with the matte caps. I mean, some of them are really cool. Like this looks like a, you know, reflective car shader. And fun fact, I actually created all of these. This is my one contribution to Blender source code is I create, no, wait, maybe not all of them. There's a couple I did not create, but the majority of these I created and submitted to the, the Blender devs, which is, hey, cool. Um, but yeah, this one's supposed to represent Sculpey and like the clay, and this is supposed to be wet, wet clay. Um, Zolt is asking, is it possible to save a PNG such matte cap view of the models? Yes, to, I think you're asking to create your own uh, matte caps. You can do that. You, you can't add them down here. This is hard coded. So you can't add your own images to this matte cap, but you can, you can create a, a matte cap material, which gets into, you know, cycles materials. You can create a matte cap material or even a Blender Render matte cap material, but that's kind of beyond this. And in, in the material example is when you would pipe in your own custom image. Okay, so thanks for reminding me about matte caps. All right, now the last one that I wanna do is, that, and maybe that I, I, you would do, I, you know, please do this exercise, I think it's a good one, is uh, a cone. And I'm gonna do that from the sphere. I'm gonna go into my local view, which is the, which is the uh, forward slash key on the number pad. So I'm in local view, everything else is hidden and I zoom in on this. Um, that's a very common way to, to, to like focus on a specific thing. And uh, yeah, so I wanna turn this into a cone. I've gone into sculpt mode, I'm gonna disable smooth shading and I'm going to uh, pick up my pen and tablet again. So the first thing I wanna do is flatten the bottom of this cone, so I'm gonna go hit control and seven on the number pad. You can see that that, that rockets me over into bottom perspective uh, of local view. Um, and then hit five. And that's gonna get me perfectly lined up at the bottom of this object. And I wanna use the flatten brush to uh, start creating this cone. I'm gonna make the size of the brush a little bit bigger than, uh, than the object. Now, you, you see me probably switching sizes and, and, and strength of brushes very fluidly and like I'm not even thinking about it. That just comes with practice. So, hence a lot of practice for the, for the homework assignment this week is that you'll, you just need to get comfortable by getting in there and doing it, knowing like intuitively what size of brush. Like I just know from a lot of experience that this size brush is gonna basically do what I want. 
and um, that's only coming with practice. So increase the strength and let's try and simply flatten this out. Oh, yikes, what in the world just happened? Well, it definitely flattened my entire mesh into a paper thin pancake. So how do we solve that? Well, there's a couple options. Um, in, in our brush options, we have uh, front faces only. So by default, you know, your brush, if it's big enough, like if my brush is this big, it's going to affect both sides of our model. And that's why we get a flattening from the top and the bottom. So we can turn on um, front faces only, and that will um, isolate the effect to be on the front for the most part. So here I can flatten it, but it's still not perfect. I think it's because my brush is so big um, that it's affecting both sides. But if I turn off accumulate down here, then that will, that should do more what I want. Okay, yeah. Um, there we go. So it at least flattened the bottom enough, but it, it still did a little bit to the top, I think just because the size of the brush. Uh, oh, no, you're right, John, thank you. Thank you, thank you, it's Z symmetry. Um, I did the same thing when I rehearsed this earlier today. Uh, that's actually probably what I should have checked first. I feel like such an idiot for just repeating that error. So, um, but I guess to my original point, you do, front faces is supposed to do that. Um, but I should have maybe been thinking a little outside of my box that symmetry is still on. Now for a cone, um, I don't need Z symmetry. I can still do X and Y, but just not Z. Now let's try that again from the bottom orthographic view. Here we go. Yeah, so you can see that it only flattened the bottom. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, that was kind of embarrassing. Awesome, so we've got the bottom flattened. Now let's start using the flatten brush to create the cone. That's just, you know, flattening out the sides all around it in a, in a circular pattern, which is made easier by um, the symmetry options that we have and get that tip to be pretty close. And then finally, let's use pinch. And I want the geometry to actually regenerate itself. Let's do pinch until we have a nice fine tip. Holding shift, we'll smooth those out. Symmetry is keeping us nice and consistent in our shape all the way around. Excellent. Now we'll go back to pinch and enable um, subdivide edges so that we can get that tip to be really tight. Smooth it out. Try and keep the sides flat. As straight as possible. How's it looking from the top? Yikes. We lost a little bit of our roundness. Just eyeballing it, get a feel for, for artistically manipulating this stuff. That's the thing about mesh modeling, it's a benefit is it's so precise. But with sculpting, it's an art to, to be precise. Okay, cool. That's looks like a Hershey Kiss, but it's basically a cone. Awesome. That is all I wanted to do for the demo. I would love to see if you guys do this, see what you think. Uh, it's an interesting game of, of trying to create these primitives um, through sculpting. And uh, yeah, let me make sure I have any other questions. Let's see here. Uh, things of asymmetry. Um, I know how to sculpt pancakes now. My life is complete. Um, well, cool. I mean, shoot, if I had known that at the beginning, I could have showed you that real quick. Um, Okay, thank you, LJ Simpson, a good class. You learned a lot, that's awesome. Sweet, so, okay, that's that's it for this class. Um, yeah, well, I'll see you in the community thread. Um, looking forward to seeing those homeworks come in. I will update the the thread right after this, the description to, to um, update the homework for week three. I changed that, kind of pulled a fast one on you. So I'll do that, make sure everybody knows what's going on and uh, also, since I did request so many models, so many sculptures be done this week, when I grade you guys, I'm going to kind of do it as a holistic kind of uh, overview grade rather than grade each one of them, um, unless there's something specific to say, you know, reference in the overview. So, but just so you know, 
um, going to be kind of like an overview grade. Um, awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. And I will see you very soon in the community thread. So have a good one. Have a good rest of your Tuesday.